Here in this video, I'm actually going to install, make a dual partition hard drive for a Linux system and a Windows 7 system. I've actually never done this before for Windows 7. I have mostly worked with Windows XP. I'm not as familiar with Windows 8 or Windows 10. This is my first time doing this on a computer where I'm going to reformat the hard drive and install Windows 7. Just put the CD in and boot it up and it's running off the CD. So I'm going to click on install now for the Windows 7. This uh, hard drive is about 160 gigabytes. That's how much I have on this hard drive. A lot of newer computers have a lot more gigabytes. I've heard about 500 gigabytes one terabyte you know two terabytes it's like a thousand gigabytes makes one terabyte so on this particular computer i have a license for um, windows professionals i'm gonna pick the um, uh, professional windows 7 professional and this is a 32-bit computer so i'll pick the x86 and then i have to accept this license and I'm not going to upgrade this because I don't want to keep anything on the hard drive. I want to reformat it. So I'm going to pick the custom option here. Initially, before I had uh, started the video, I had actually partitioned the drive. I'd split the hard drive into two. It's a 160 gigabyte hard drive, but I had about 149 gigabytes available to partition. So I split the hard drive into a 73 gigabytes for the Windows and a 75 which is unallocated so when I install the Linux I can take this and split it up into additional hard drives so right now most of the Windows installation will be on disk partition 2 which is consider the uh, partition on a hard drive like a room in a house you have a house with no rooms that's what your hard drive is when you start partitioning it it's like creating different rooms in the house so I pick a couple of rooms for Windows I pick a couple of rooms for Linux. I pick a couple of uh, rooms for, you know, memory or swap space. So that's how you think about this. You know, when you partition a hard drive, it's like splitting a room, uh, making rooms inside a house where you have no rooms. And the hard drive is basically the house. So let's go ahead and go to next on this. I'm going to select partition two. And it's starting to copy all the Windows files It'll start to expand it, install the features, install updates, um, and then complete the installation. There's a status bar right here that's uh, it's in green. You can't really see it well enough. I think it has to go all the way to the end for this to be done. So I'm just going to pause the video and let it get through, and then we'll go to the next step. So it took about nine minutes to load the Windows software and it restarted Windows. I'm going to see what it's doing next. Um, it started up Windows again. So it's taking me through the same screen. I probably made a mistake. I think I was supposed to restart and take the CD out, but it didn't tell me to do that. Let me try that and see what happens. Okay, I've just pulled this, the CD out and let's see if it boots up, if it doesn't boot up then I would have to restart the installation. So let's see what happens next. So it's telling me now it's starting services. I don't know what that means. So let me time this. I don't have the CD in there anymore, so I'm surprised it's still working. But like I said, this is my first time doing this. It's restarting. It took about three, three minutes, 42 seconds to complete that part of the install. So now I'm up at uh, Windows 7 Professional. So it's asking me to type a username. I'll just type a random one. It's asking me for a password. I'll probably use the same thing. Because I don't plan to use Windows as, the, as my main system. So I don't really care. So I'm now asked to enter a product key. I'm going to enter it and then start the video right after it. So I got to the next screen. I'm only going to install important updates. Security updates, I really, like I said, I'm not going to be on the internet. Anytime I'm on the internet with Windows, I'm going to be disconnecting my ethernet cord or have the Wi-Fi turned off. Um, so now I'm going to set up uh, my time. Okay, now it's going ahead and finalizing all the settings for Windows 7 Professional. And as I mentioned before, only half the hard drive is consumed being consumed by Windows 7, the other half will be consumed by Linux. 
and we'll go into the Linux installing mode next after I'm done with this. If anything, I'll use Windows 7 maybe to play a few games. Other than that, or maybe some applications that only run on Windows 7. But other than that, I don't plan to use Windows very much at all. Okay, it seems that my uh, install went fine. I'm going to try and restart. This was pretty simple, you know. When I installed Windows XP, it took a lot more effort. So I guess Microsoft did something good going from XP to Windows 7. They made it simpler to install. Look at the different uh, applications, all the programs. It's just standard programs, I suppose. I'm going to see if I can open up some videos on here. Great, the videos are working just as I thought. So my next step, I think, would be to install the Linux system. I'm going to try and load Linux Mint. It's a popular version these days. It's uh, version 20.1 with a cinnamon desktop. Now, Linux comes with many different kinds of uh, desktops and the Cinnamon desktop is more resource intensive, meaning it uses up more memory. It gives you a better presentation on the desktop, but it does consume a lot of res resources. And I think for my computer here right now will be uh, sufficient. I have a Dell 7010, it's about 12 years old. It has about eight gigabytes of memory. It has sufficient hard drive space to load uh, the Linux Mint. I'm going to go ahead and see how to go about partitioning the drive when you have Windows and Linux on it. I'm going to close this out and restart. So the next time it's going to boot up off the Linux Mint 20 version DVD. Uh, most of the Linux distributions now had to be loaded on a DVD or a USB. Linux Mint has to totally load up before you can install it. So this will take some time. I'm going to put a timer for it again. It would take about four minutes to load up Linux Mint. So I'm going to click on install Linux Mint. There's a little icon right there. And it asks me if it's English. Yes. I don't want to connect to the Wi-Fi network. Hit continue. Install. I'm going to check on install multimedia codecs. Hit continue. Um, now it's asking me different options. This computer currently has Windows 7 on it. Uh, would I like to install Linux Mint alongside Windows 7? Erase the entire disk and install Linux Mint or something else. I'm going to try install Linux Mint alongside Windows 7 and see what happens there. If I pick something else, then I can create or resize partitions for Linux Mint. Let me see what this does. Normally, I like to adjust the partitions on my own, but in this case, I'm going to let the DVD make that decision here. I could always go back and redo this. So it's telling me the partition tables of the following devices are changed. Talking about partition 3 and partition 4, partition 5, I don't know about a 5. So let me go back and see if I can do the something else and manually adjust this. I always prefer to see the partitions before any changes are made. We have two partitions, partition one, which is formatted in NTFS for Windows 7. It has the main system files on this first partition, SDA1. SDA2 is also for Windows. That is consuming about 78 gigabytes of space. I also have 81 gigabytes of free space, which I will use. This free space will be partitioned for Linux. So let's select that one right now. I'm going to click on the plus sign that you see here. Right here there's a plus sign. And I'm going to further uh, split this up into additional partitions. So I'm going to click on primary partition here. 40,000 for the partition I want the operating system for Linux to go on. The type of partition you want is a ext4. There are many different options here. ext3, ext2. Um, XFS, JFS, FAT16, um, but you don't want to uh, use any of that, you want to use EXT4. Uh, the mount point, you want the boot files, you will select that and hit OK. So it, it creates a SDA3, which is an EXT, you can see it here, 
And if you were to think of this as a house with rooms in it, I've just created a house. I've created maybe a living room. SDA 1 is the living room. SDA 2 might be the dining room. SDA 3 might be one of the bedrooms. So I'm starting to create little rooms in the house and think of the house as the whole hard drive that has storage space. And now I'm creating rooms in the house to store certain things in the rooms. Like in the living room, you only want certain types of furniture. You don't want a bed in the living room. Basement, you want only certain types of things in the basement. So that's what I'm doing here, basically splitting up the hard drive into different spaces. So this SDA3 will contain all the boot files for Linux, at least this version of Linux. And if you work with other versions of Linux, you can do the same thing. And keep in mind that I picked 40, um, 40 gigabytes because I had 80 gigabytes left on the hard drive. Let's say you have 500 gigabytes on the hard drive. You can split it up any way you want. You can split up, uh, you know, you can pick the first 250 for the boot space and the remaining 250 for other parts of the hard drive, but it's up to you how you want to split it up. But I always try to give the boot portion on Linux the most amount of um, hard drive space. If you only have a 80 gigabyte hard drive, then you have to be more conservative. But again, try to give the most amount of gigabytes or space uh, on the partition to the boot sector. And then I'm going to create another partition. For this part of the partition, I actually changed the size of the partition to 40,000, which is 40,000 megabytes. And then it's going to be a logical drive, not the primary drive. I picked the ext4 journaling file system, so that's what I would pick for any Linux hard drive. Um, and then I also picked the type of um, files that should reside in there. It's the home files. Um, I have about 1397 megabytes of free space. I'm going to select under the ext4 journaling system, I'm going to put swap area. You always need some swap space for Linux. So I'm going to go back to this one here, the ext4 that I said should be boot. I'm going to change that to the main primary. If you see the backslash, all the main files will reside in there. You could create a separate partition for the boot drive, but I would not recommend doing that. You select the slash symbol and that'll put all the major files that actually load up the operating system and everything related to it in this particular part of the hard drive. And so we have an SDA3, which again stores all the uh, Linux operating system files that boot up the system, run your system. The ext4 uh, SDA5 part of the partition hard drive would store your home files, like your documents, videos, pictures, anything that you store on the hard drive. And then we have a third part of the hard drive that we keep as swap space. They have some recommendations on what the swap space should be, but in this case, I only picked like 1.4 gigabytes. Generally, two gigabytes is sufficient, but um, you have to look at what operating system in Linux you're using and follow their recommendations. When you install these partitions, you have to install Windows first. If you don't install Windows first, you would have trouble. I haven't heard of anyone loading Linux first and then installing Windows. There might be a way to do it, but I've never done it that way. And I haven't read any articles that tell you to do it that way either. Now, if you look here, um, you have all the partitions kind of summarized on the top row with color codes. There's the SDA1 on the extreme left at 104.9 megabytes. This stores the Windows files in the NTFS uh, format. And then you have the storage space for the Windows files SDA2 with 78.5 gigabytes. Again, in the NTFS uh, format, the three partitions for Linux are SDA3, SDA5, and SDA6. SDA3 has 40 gigabytes. It'll store all the main operating system files for Linux. The SDA5 space um, will store all the documents, pictures, and videos. It's in the ext4 format. And then you have SDA6, which is the sixth or the fifth partition on this hard drive, which will be the swap space. So you really only need three partitions for Linux. 
Windows really needs only two, but you could make more than two. Like if you see a C and a D drive on Windows, it means that you have probably three partitions. I'm gonna go ahead and install this. It will take a little bit of time to install all this. SDA3, SDA5, and SDA6 are gonna be formatted. That's the message I get here. So I'm gonna put a timer and see how long it takes to do that. It's asking me the uh, time zone I'm at. I'm gonna say Chicago. And it's asking me to enter a name. It actually took 15 minutes to install this. I have eight gigabytes on the system. It's got a 3.2 gigahertz processor. You need at least four these days to run anything Linux oriented. But they do have Linux systems that run on two gigabytes. There are even systems that run on one gigabyte or less. But you have to do some adjustments and tweaking uh, to the system to make it work right. It's asking me to restart. So I'm loading up uh, Linux Mint. I'm going to show you what a dual boot system really means. When you start up the system, it gives you the option of going into Linux Mint or Windows. And right now I'm in Linux Mint, but I'm going to restart the system and kind of show you real quick. It comes up with a menu up here that asks you which system you want to go into. You can't go into both at the same time. You can run one or the other. And if you have Windows programs, you can run Windows programs on it. If you have Linux programs, you can run it on here. So this is what the Linux desktop looks like. I can customize the background to anything I want. So I'm going to restart this and kind of show you. Um, Linux is pretty neat because it doesn't cost you a thing to use Linux systems. It's all free. The software is free. The only drawback to Linux is if you run into issues on like Windows, you can't just pick up the phone and call technical support. You have to actually go into these blogs and read up and try to find out or there are little uh, websites you can go into for these different Linux programs where you can enter your problem and other people will try to help you. It doesn't happen overnight, you know, it may take a few days to resolve and a lot of people don't have patience with that. So. They skip out and they go out by the windows for a hundred bucks or two hundred bucks, buy all the software with it that costs them another three hundred to four hundred bucks. So all the while, every year you're spending money, you're spending money on the firewall, on the antivirus. With Linux, I have um, just a firewall active. I don't need antivirus because not too many people have it. A lot of the virus programs are designed for Windows because they want it to really significantly affect a lot of people. And since Linux is not used by a lot of people, not a lot of um, hackers want to mess around with creating a virus for something that very few people use. They want to create the maximum havoc they can with the virus programs. So I'm going to restart this and so I can show you how you can go into the different systems. When I'm in Linux, I have my internet connected. When I go into Windows, I disconnect my internet before it disappears. Uh, that's the window. If you don't change the options, it goes automatically into Linux Mint. I'm going to select Windows and I'm going to click Windows and I'll go into the Windows operating system now. If I just left it as is, it would automatically go into Linux. So now I'm going to Windows. It's in the Windows operating system as you can see. It's, it's that simple, you know, it's basically installing and creating a dual boot system is basically knowing how to partition the hard drives. You know, if you have questions, you can always send me a comment on this video. I will be creating more videos like this on different systems. I've used a lot of different Linux systems. I have another computer that runs MX Linux, which is pretty popular. So I pretty much like them all. If I had a choice, I would run different ones on my computer, but I have only a certain amount of space. I would highly urge you to try a Linux system. If you want Windows 10, only Microsoft makes it. But for Linux, you can find hundreds of different types of Linux systems. There's Red Hat Linux, there's uh, Linux Mint, there's Ubuntu, there's Kubuntu, Lubuntu. And I could go on and on, you know, about all the different types of uh, Linux. And all the Linux systems are actually designed and 
worked on by volunteers, which who take volunteer funding. No one gets paid for this. It's all done by volunteers. So you do find issues, you know, you might have your sound system not work right when you install it, then you have to go ahead and try to figure out how to fix it. Certain systems work right out of the box, but with Dell, you know, I've had uh, some problems with Ubuntu. Ubuntu Mate on a Dell computer, a Dell 8200, I had a lot of problem getting the sound system working on that. I also had problems with uh, screen flickering, which I couldn't get rid of, so I couldn't really use Ubuntu Mate on an 8200 computer. But on this particular 7010 Dell, I'm using the Linux Mint for now. I can switch to MX Linux. Those are the ones I would recommend. You also have to make a choice on the type of desktop. Do you want an FCE? Do you want a Cinnamon? And they have a couple other versions too. They have a Mate desktop. And each one consumes a certain amount of resources from your computer. Cinnamon being the most resource intensive. XFCE desktop being the least. So hopefully that helps you. And hopefully I get some comments and feedback on this video. So I can make more. Thank you.